Do you see the you see in the chat? Okay. So hi everyone. I'm Simi Sanindawa. I'm calling all the way from Botswana in the southern part of Africa. Uh hey Lydia, hey Gus, thank you for making it. And I'll be talking about my uh, project work in the Du Bois Challenge, which is a annual data visualization challenge. So going through the talk, I'll be talking about the challenge itself, who started it and how and who organizes it, and the who W.E.B. Du Bois was, and the, the man who created um, the data visualizations that which inspired the, the challenge, the challenge for this year, which is beginning of, of 2024, the recreations using R that I did and other data visualization challenges that I take part in. So just a little bit about myself. I've been a teaching assistant at the Department of Computer Science at UB, University of Botswana. Before then, I was a business analyst at the Gauteng Department of Education in Johannesburg, South Africa. I actually worked there for a year and a half after I graduated for my, oh, uh, for my bachelor's. Sometimes I blog, and I also like making data visualizations. And speaking of such, these are some of my data visualizations that I've made all with R. Some of them come from project works from Tidy Tuesday, the other challenges like um, the 30 day chart challenge. So most, most of them I use R and I don't think I would have been able to achieve them if I hadn't have joined um, Data Visualization Society, which the, the Du Bois challenge is actually from. So what they do is that they also have a select channel and all the visualization challenges that they have, people can post their work and whatever tool they use, R, Python, and Observable, they post it there and they get constructive comments from other data visualizers. So the Du Bois challenge was actually started by Anthony Starks, who was around 2021. So what happened was Anthony Starks was collecting all of W.E.B. Du Bois's work from the Paris, what was it called? The Paris World Fair in 1900. So he wanted to collect, he think he collected about a hundred photo photographs and a hundred data visualizations, which were made by W.E.B. Du Bois. The first challenge started in February, 2021. And it was actually started online by Alan Hillary and Sakur Taylor because they saw Alan Starks had collected all of W.E.B. Du Bois's work and they wanted to make a challenge out of it, wanting to, instead, wanting to use the latest modern technology as a Python, observable. And it happens, you think, mid-February and ends beginning of April. It's supposed to be 10 weeks. Originally, it started from seven and they made it 10 weeks. So every year, Every so not yeah every year, beginning of the year it goes for ten weeks and every week there's a, a data visualization of Du Bois's work that people have to recreate and they have to showcase it and share their code just like the Tidy Tuesday work. So if you want to see some of Anthony's work, he has article. He made a he's prepared an article for the Data Visualization Society as well as the Nightingale magazine. And most of his, most of the, the work I got from the article, from the Nightingale article. So who exactly was W.E.B. Du Bois? Sometimes I, I I figure people can confuse him for Booker T. Washington, but he was actually, actually an American lecturer. He was born in Massachusetts. And let me just move this because I can't really remember so much of his <laughs> much of his biography. He was born in Massachusetts and died in Accra, Ghana after moving there in 1963. And you can see, looking at his whole life, he was born around the Reconstruction era of America and died during the Civil Rights Movement. And apparently he was the first African-American to graduate with a PhD from Harvard University. Before then, he attended Fisk University in Tennessee. He was also a sociologist and a civil rights activist. He was also the co-founder of the NAACP, along with what lady's name. Uh, she was an American writer. I forgot her. I keep forgetting her name. But yeah, she after after becoming a co-founder of the NAACP, he also became an editor for. <laughs> I also forgot the name. I forgot the name of the magazine, but I'll try and get it eventually. 
So what E.W.E.B. Du Bois did was he wanted to take part in the 1900s Paris Exposition, which have happened in Paris. It was a world fair, or uh, actually a trade fair at the time, which um, showcased some of the second industrial revolution a second industrial revolution, industrial revolution, technological developments, which uh, showed the metro, the, under, the underground metro in Paris. They also showed um, the steam, en well, not the steam engine, but I think uh, a sort of a train that, well, that's the metro. Uh, what else did they do? Man, they also, one of Paris's um, technological advancements wanted to show the, the camera, how they work on cinematography. They wanted to show the the at the time they used street lights. So at that's I think that's where they where Paris got its other name, the City of Lights, because that it was one of the first cities at the time to have street lights. They also that year hosted the Olympics in nineteen hundred. So it's gonna be it would be the hundred and twenty fourth yeah, it's good. It's going to be a hundred. Well, it is one hundred and twenty-four years since the time, and this year the Olympics happened as well. And in eighteen ninety-five, I think before then they had the bust of the Statue of Liberty at the Paris Exposition. That's very interesting. So the Du Bois challenge this year, I think Anthony Starks wanted to focus on the colors, so he wanted to look at the Pan African colors, which were red, black, and green. So for the three weeks, they'll look at the red um, color. The other three weeks, they'll look at the black. And the last few weeks, they looked at the green. And some of the terms and references used in the charts were old-fashioned terms that they used to re refer to Black people, African people. So for the sake of this workshop, for the sake of this talk, we're just going to be using the terms that he used so to stay true to his original work. So the first week, um, the first week of the challenge, Anthony Starks picked up this uh, chart, which represents the Negro population of Georgia by counties. And this, I didn't know how to go about it because I'm not really used to shape files. So what I did was looking at the code here, just move this here. Just use there. So looking at the code here, I wanted to use ggplot dplyr. To, to make the plots, I used I wanted to also use the maps to get the map of the USA and to get the Georgia state. And I wasn't sure whether to use the patchwork or cow plot so I could put all the plots together. After loading the libraries, some of them I used, I also used ggforce and I also I wanted to use a deep line instead of instead of um, loading deep. I wanted to use deep line instead of using the tidyverse because I could see that when every time I tried to to save and run the work, uh, tidyverse wouldn't really run all the the libraries. So what I did was let me just show you what I did in in our studio. So how do I do from here? Let me just open, remove that, move my new file. So after copying that, let me paste it in my art studio. I hope everyone can see so far. Is it all right? We can see it, yeah. You can see it, okay. After installing the packages, I loaded my packages like so. G4, so I wanted to use the Geom circle so I can get the legends um, circles. Again, the original plot and the cow plot. I don't know. Oh, yeah, I, I eventually used the cow plot because I could see the patchwork wasn't as strong to combine all the plots. So, what I did was in the GitHub where all the data sets were, I wanted to, as you can see here, I put in a data set for the 1980s to get the first. Man, am I sharing my... Can you all see my screen? Yep. Yeah, we can see the whole screen. Yeah. Can you see the whole screen? Where did I put... Oh, maybe I shouldn't have closed that. Let me just... Sorry, let me just look for my... 
I'm just looking for yeah, this is the one I come on, not this one. I wanted to get the shouldn't have closed that. If you open Chrome, you might be able to reopen it with Control Shift T if you opened the file rather than the um live preview. Yeah. Well, I guess I didn't I didn't save this one in the in the quarter file, but can we all still see it, still see it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for that guess. Okay, where was I? So I'm just gonna leave this pin. So what I did was I wanted to put in the 1870s data set in its own uh, variable and the 1880s to get both data sets because they both have um, the data, the, da the populations for those years. So what I did was I got the data sets from Anthony Stock's repository. I ran those. And what I did was I wanted to wrangle some of the data here. So I wanted to change the names because in the data sets, it's, uh, it's quite different. I could open it up, but I didn't prepare to open data sets just yet. So instead, I wanted to change the names so they could be the same. Yeah, I wanted to change some, I wanted to change the columns to subregion and population so that they could all be standardized in, for the 1970s data set. I did the same for the 1880s data set. And to use the, the map library, I wanted to first get the world. It is what it is. I wanted to get the, the whole globe, all the planets, all the, all the continents. And I got the states. And to go down a bit, I wanted to get the Georgia state in particular. So I put that in its own variable. And I named it Georgia. And to merge the data sets, I wanted to actually merge both data sets, the 1870 and the 1880s together. I wish I could, anyway, it's gonna show it eventually. And to order the columns, because is because in the data sets, they weren't aligned properly. I think by, was it by population or sub-region and latitude and longitude, but I could, just to make clear, I, I, actually I should have prepared the data set so I could show you guys. There's also a part in the data set where I had to also change the standardization because in the the column, the population column, it showed a hundred thousand to two to two point five hundred, but it wasn't very clear because I wanted them to be all the same. So instead of having it all with the with the minute with the maximum and the minimum sign, I just wanted them to just have the figures like so on their own. So after I did that for yeah, after I did that for all the ranges, I for 1870, I did the same for 1880. So, all, so they could all put the same. So they so that they could all be the same. And to plot the 1870s map, what I did was I used ggplot and I also went ahead and used some of the colors as well to get some of the states or the counties that had a certain range and after doing that I got 1870s uh, map with uh, colors representing the different population ranges and I also went ahead and did the top right, top right legend and that's how I got the legend I think that's at the then I think that's at the top right or the bottom left. Oh, no, this one's the bottom left. So the bottom left, what I did was I created, what I did was I created four different plots. The plot for the maps and the plot for the legends. So for the plots for the legends, I used the GG plot to create a one data frame, just um, a normal uh, data frame. And I put in some of the ranges to make it look like so. I put in the, the circles and I also put in the ranges by the side and I also I made it, how did I do this? I changed the background to minimal or transparent so that 
that the, so that the background couldn't be seen or the, the grid marks couldn't be seen. I also did the same for 1880. We've got the 1880 map there. And to combine everything, I used the car plot, the GG draw, to put in the title. And yeah, to put everything together. It looks small right now, but I'm going to show you how it looks uh, with everything together. So to fix the the, le the lengths and the widths, I had to change it using some of the ranges here. And also to add the color to look like the original. I had, okay, yeah, there we go. And I had the final looking like so. So to put everything together to save it properly, I did you saved it. Let me just refresh. I'll put there. Yeah, and that's how I got my first um, chart. Can we all see the chart? Yep. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, not not like the original, but it's sort of this was the first chart I, I tried to create. So what do you think so far? I'm just gonna stop there. Oh, I think it's great. I'd heard about the challenge so far. So getting more background on like where it came from was cool because I had no idea. I just like I'd seen the charts, I'd heard about the challenge and I didn't really know anything else. Um, but for this part, I think if you're presenting it posit conf, a lot of people are going to know sort of like the data manipulation side of things and what they'll be really interested in. And what I thought was really cool was using Calplot to lay it out because it's not really something I had like thought of. Like I've seen people's tidy Tuesdays in their challenge, um, charts before but I always like was what like thought about oh how'd they lay this out that looks so good and like for some reason it never occurred to me to make separate plots and then lay them out this way and so I think sort of going more into like the styling of things would uh it would sort of scratch the itch for a lot of people oh okay the styling thing all right yeah, because I mean, it's, it's the focus of the challenge is the styling. And so focusing yeah. on that, like the background of the challenge and then how to really like make the the plots. Okay. Yeah, I agree because I don't, well, actually, like you do have the code in your slides, but yeah, um, yeah, less code heavy or like the, like what gets, I said with regards to the data motivation. But yeah, this is really cool. I'm excited to see this as I thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How would you how would you say with coming to the styling, what should I focus on more? Gus? I'm trying to think about like what you could do more on styling. I guess maybe before jumping into the code, like you, you touched on how the colors, I think it was the reds and then the blacks and then yellows, mm -hmm. but going more into like sort of what defines that visual style. Because I know if you showed me a bunch of charts, I could pick out the ones that are in that style, but like I couldn't necessarily put it into words. Okay. okay. Yeah, you were talking about showing this code. Uh, it, oh, I just didn't hear what Sumi said. Oh, Lydia was mentioned. She was talking about showing less code, something like that. Yeah, just I don't know. Let me let's see the. There's more of the presentation, right? It is yeah, but I'll be showing yeah. a lot more code. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I do have a code thought, but I'll save it for the end. Yeah, let's go through. It, it's more of like a general code thought than anything specific. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I should have prepared it a little bit more. 
It's just that I I prepared this beginning of the year and I put it away mm -hmm. and I gave a talk for our lady earlier. So this is the first time I'm looking at it since June. No, oh, it's okay. Good. That's what Project Club is for. It's for yeah. it's for practicing and getting it out there. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I guess, yeah, I guess when it comes to like presenting it later, Gus, were you gonna mention kind of like the code highlighting stuff? No, actually. Oh. Um, I, yeah. I was going to skip that. Oh, okay, okay. That, that is a good yeah. one to mention. Yeah, because then you could always later on just any bits of code that you specifically want to point out, do like the code highlighting. Yeah. Okay. But that would mean that I would have to highlight in the presentation before going to our studio, right? Or could I do the highlighting yeah. in our studio? You do it. It's part of Quarto. Um, yeah, it's I'll, part of Quarto. Try and find the link. In a minute mm -hmm. but that Lydia makes a good point that for what I said about like showing how you're building the plots you could show each component you can show the mm -hmm. code that creates that component right next to the output yeah. and so like mm -hmm. you showed the um the legend being created and you can show mm -hmm. the code just that created the legend right next to the legend okay. and then like so I wouldn't have you mm -hmm. sort of so all of the steps of building it and putting it together. Oh, all right. So that would mean that I wouldn't have to go to our studio. Yep. Yeah, because I don't think you could do that during the presentation also. Well, rather, I haven't I seen anyone do that during the I think it depends on how big of a name you are. I think the big names can get away with it, maybe. Right. But the smaller <laughs> names, probably not. Yeah, because yeah. they... They avoid any sort of live coding just for like technical issues. Yeah. So pretty much whatever you're presenting, you'd ideally want it all to work within like your Cordo or whatever, like if you're PowerPoint, mm -hmm. but I'm assuming Cordo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I just realized when I was going through the uh, the colors, that was I think that like what you were talking about. The like the, the what defines the visual style. So Anthony Starks was because he watched some of the presentation and he was talking about the the colors. So that could be part of the the talk with like the theme and what defines the style. I think I could talk about that for the kind of palette and okay. Anyway, right. So after seeing that, this is my output using R and putting them together. We have the original and the recreated design oh okay i mm. see cool documentation they look pretty spot on to me mm -hmm. like trying to get the like hand-drawn crayon style would be really cool but it would probably be so much extra work yeah. i uh federica did a very good job recreating the original i think she used there was some colors she used or I think there's a package that works on something that looks hand drawn. Yeah, I know there's like a few different packages that will let you add instead of just using color blocks, a lot you add textures to mm -hmm. to things. But um, I haven't mm -hmm. really played around with them too too much. I I know I use one in one place and that's it for like a column chart. Oh, all right. How long is this supposed to be? The 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 project club is it supposed to be an hour or thirty minutes? We're okay. capped total time at an hour, but you can take as much time as as you want. Okay, because I'm sort of aiming for one hour. Yep, that sounds okay. good. So, all right, thanks. Let me just continue after the first challenge. The second week had the slaves and free Negroes plot. It looks like a an, a sideways area chart. So what I did was just close this again. I used the tidyverse and the ggplot, ggplot package, and oopsie. So after loading those libraries, I used the data set from Anthony Stark's work to get the, the data sets. And what I did was I just went ahead and created the plot using that data set and to get to get the colors on the left and right side, I filled with the black and the red. 
and I also use the minimal theme and I put in the labels and I also put in the different titles, the captions, and I also left the axis as black to get um to get um to get the background as good as the original. I also annotated some of the text in the chart and after flipping the area chart i saved it and i got the r code output i know i didn't put the the lines as in the original but it sort of looks like uh, the original so when it comes to explaining how i did it i'm not really sure oh like you were saying i could highlight some of the code maybe i think i should have done that i think i'll do it for the others as well. So this for, is the original and my recreated version. Yeah. For this one, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen it where people will assign ggplot to the variable p and like they'll slowly build it, but you can show the plot as you're adding sort of each component of your code. So like you show it on like your first few steps where you have sort of have a basic area chart and then you show where you've changed the modified the colors and then a few more steps and you've added some annotations and like the coordinate flip and sort of show all of the steps of it coming together. All right. So we show the code on one side and the chart on the other side. Okay. I think I will do that. I'll send sort of, I'll try and find an example of someone doing it that way and I'll send it. All right. Thanks for that. And most of them are just like that. I just uh, explained the code here, and then I showed what I got, the output. My uh, gener my generated R code with the original next to it. So it's gonna it, most of the most of the, the the rest of the talk is the same for all the yeah charts. So I don't know whether to continue that way or should I just I mean okay, it's up to you me I'm, just... I'm having yeah. a good time and I'm learning so I'm uh -huh. it, it's totally up to you okay. I'm taking notes that... as I yeah I'm just gonna take notes and save everything for later um so as you keep going through I'll think of stuff yeah all right thanks Lydia uh this is the seventh one so I what what I think what I will do is just continue until I reach the end. Yeah. It's going to be the same. So, this is the eighth week of the challenge. So, Anthony Stark chose the rise of Negroes from slavery to freedom to one gener. That's supposed to be generation. So, I think what I should have done was also put the charts under the colors. Yeah. So, to go with the style to see which chart is under which color. So for this one, I used uh, the GG plot and the cow plot. And after loading them, I got the data sets from Anthony Starks. I started with this one, like I started creating the first, which one is this? I started creating the first data set, which is this one on top. This one which showed the 81%, the 80, the 81% tenants and the 90% peasants. So that I had to create, I think this was a, a bar chart and I, I used some annotations. I did the same with the 1860s data set. I reshaped it, I pivoted. And after creating the stack bar plot, Putting everything together, I got my generated R code. And as you can, I don't know if you could see looking at the original, it has some lines here that go from 1850 to 1890. I only saw it at the end, so I, I didn't even add it. So I just left it out because I just couldn't be bothered putting them back. So with the annotations, I with this one, I created one, two, three, three plots and put them all together using cow plot. With the ninth week, this would be under the green style. I used only two packages 
And what I did was I wanted to convert the, the wide format into the long format because I just thought that would be a lot easier. See something in the chat here? Oh, okay, Gus just it's said... It's just me. You can ignore it for now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to create the stacked R plot after changing from the wide format to the long format, I created a stacked area chart and I colored it black. To, I colored the lower part black and I used a lot of annotations to get all the figures at the top and at the bottom, which eventually which eventually led me to create the generate the R generated output and put them together. So you can see they're a bit similar, except for I didn't put the lines that come from the years to the area chart, but it looks sort of the same. Oh, sorry, lady, were you looking at it? Oh, all right. Um, and this was the, the final week was a bit complicated. I didn't think I was gonna manage gonna be I was gonna manage to do it because you could you can see there's a map of the states. There are a lot of annotations, the legend and a pie chart and a lengthy narrative at the bottom. So I thought, okay, let me just try and do it. So what I did was I looking at it, I, I knew that I had to create a lot of plots and put them together. So what I did was I started from the top. I first created a, a plot for the narrative on top. So it looks as though I was, I planned on making one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine plots, and then I was going to put them all together. So what I did was I started with the title annotation at the top to create the title annotation. I created a blank plot uh, with the five to 12 dimensions, and I put in a, the, the narrative as the, the main um, title in the plot. Oops. I also did the same for the subtitles at the bottom, at the, at the sides here, because the charts were done in French and in English. So they, they have two languages. Everything had to be translated because of where the, the fair was in, in France. I did the same with the subtitles in, in French as in the original chart. And what I did to get the United States, I had to use the map, the map library. So to do this, I needed to painfully color every state. <laughs> I had to look at the states in detail and I had to put in the different colors. I'm sure there was an easier way, but I wanted to be sure what I'm doing. So after managing to put all of those colors together, so this would be a good time to put the code as well as the chart at the side like you were talking about. So after creating the map challenge, uh, after creating the, the map, plot the map with matching state names, which side is this? This would be... Hmm, I think this, I think this would be, I'm not sure which one it is, I'm not to be sure, but I think it's also part of the annotation. This map annotation shows the bottom of the map. So I created the same as the title, a blank plot, and then put the narrative in the middle. I did the same for the English side as well as the French side. It would be both annotations at the side of the map. English side. So making the pie chart, I just used the R bind to create the pie chart. And I wanted to put the chart in order. So what I did was I took the chart from I think I, I where did I get the chart? Was or did I save it? I took the chart from Anthony's repository. I don't know when. I don't remember where I saved it. Actually, don't see it there. But I used the data set from there, and I put it all together, and that's how I created the ordered pie chart. And to create the side legends, the same as with the first chart, I used the 
Did you circle? And I put the the matching texts beside it, and I did it for the French and the English side. Using the annotated, the right side would be the English side, and the left side was for the French side. And the long narrative that was at the bottom here was created the same way as the title and the legend. And putting them all together using the cow plot, the captions, I have my recreated barcode and putting them together. It's not just like the original. I think my generated uh, our output looks a bit stretched and it looks really bright. <laughs> not, and I could also, I noticed that my pie chart was not as, it wasn't as ordered as the original. So looking at the other data visualizations that I used, I used the back to this basics, which is a tableau challenge for people to work on their data visualizations. It also helps to build your portfolio. I use the 30 day chart challenge. It also helps me work on my comparisons, just distributions and other categories. The, sorry about that. The storytelling with data, which is also a monthly data visualization challenge that people can work on. I think it was in April, they had Napoleon's Waterloo battle map, which they which what they wanted people to recreate. So I thought that was very fun to do. There's the 30 day map challenge that happens every November. I would like to take part, of it, part in it, but I think I'll wait for next year because I'm kind of busy right now. And of course, there's the Tidy Tuesday that I like to take part on, take part, take part in. So these are some of the data visualization projects and challenges that helped me grow as a data visualizer. So if you want to get in touch, you can follow me on Mastodon, LinkedIn, um, my GitHub, and where I put all my work. And you can go ahead and check out Our Ladies Haburuni, uh, which has all the meetups, the blogs, and everything that goes on in Botswana concerning R and in Africa. So yeah, thanks guys. Thank you so much for listening. I was or doing the emoji for clapping, but I probably could have came <laughs> oh, Thank that's you. Awesome. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So Gus, if you want to chime in first. Or... Yeah, for sure. Um. In the chat, that thing that I was like, you can ignore me for now. Um, that's sort of what I was thinking for the style of displaying each component. Um, and then wrapping a, an assignment line, really any line mm -hmm. of R in parentheses, will usually print the new value. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a fancy way to make stuff print without having an explicit line that says print. Or writing oh, out yeah. the print. Um, it doesn't always work. And there's some like weird advanced R kind of specifics about why sometimes it doesn't work. But for mm -hmm. the most part, it should. Um, and then for like showing code, I would, again, I would sort of just hide away a lot of the like reading in the data set and formatting mm -hmm. it, but I would still probably show the final format of the data that you use to make the plots, just so people sort of know what you're working with. Um, and then, yeah, combining the like, either doing line highlighting or just showing like an entire chunk and saying this chunk made the pie chart and then this chunk made oh. pie chart of the US and then on it, like then this chunk puts all of it together using cowplot. Um, okay. Yeah. And then sort of like another uh, definitely off topic note in R, there is no right way to do things, but sometimes there are ways to do things that make it a little bit less painful. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think for you really diving into like the tidyverse syntax mm -hmm. should help a lot um they're like again not none of the code you had was wrong it was all wonderful and it did the job but there are a lot of lines you had typed out that were very long and then sort of like uh duplicated and there are many shorter ways of writing it 
uh, using yeah. tidyverse. Yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, I was trying to look for, well, actually, I guess I'll find one later. Mm -hmm. Lydia, you're mute. You muted yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate it when I, that happens. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. Um, well, actually, let me look at what Gus put in, if it's. That was already the thing about code, the code box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to find an example where it's like they're the side by side. But yeah, I'll send you one. I think one thing I think I would have liked to see, I think before you dive into the code, I want to see the two plots side by side. I want to see the original and I want to see yours. And then I kind of want, I would want to hear you kind of go into, um, things you did like specifically yeah like as far as like mentioning like the packages or even the data I think mentioning that like once up front and then like once you're talking about each of the each of the um visualizations you don't necessarily have to talk about the specific packages unless it's one that's very specific to that um like one that's specific to that chart because maybe it's a special geo that you needed like the maps you need like a different geom to make maps than for like circles and stuff like that um so yeah so i'd want to see them side by side your mm -hmm. um, like for each challenge the original and yours and then yeah go into the code and like specific parts of the code and then one thing i liked hearing about is kind of like you kind of talking about okay this is what i did but this is what i could have done to make it more similar to the original and that's something yeah. I would like to learn because I like the idea of knowing what you did learn and the fact that you still have other things that you want to learn like mm -hmm. I think that's important yeah. Um, yeah so like that you if you learned new geomes if you learned new ways to um for manipulation like the fact that mm -hmm. like even just mentioning the fact that it took like an eye for detail to do like, it was like, you put a lot of like attention to detail into doing these charts. Like even you mentioned kind of painstakingly having to figure out the different colors yeah. for that. Yeah, so that's that's like, that's a big deal. So like, yeah. Um, so the lessons learned, yeah. Yeah, I think that I would think, be well, that would agree that would make a good talk. Yeah, yeah, okay. the lessons learned for sure. Um, and then I forget the the challenges you mentioned at the end. I know one of them you said you wanted to do. Have you done those already? Have you? Done I have done some of them. Yeah, some of them already. Okay, so yeah. perhaps even I think in the beginning, maybe even mentioning those challenges because like if you've done those before and then saying okay, I've already, I kind of like challenges and then I'm doing this new challenge and this is what it taught me and what I want to put into future challenges. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, move that to the beginning, okay. Yeah. That's cool. I could do that, all right. Yeah, and then- That's a twist on the normal format, but I really like it because normally everyone's like, here's a challenge and then here's more, but like saying, I already did these. Here's it, I like that, that's fun. Mm. yeah because then it could be like kind of like the idea that the more challenges you do you're able to put to use what you already know but you're there's still more to learn like there's always more to learn kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah and I think that's what I have so far but I'll probably definitely go back and watch this and then if your code is available maybe even I don't know provide any feedback I forgot what we talked I forgot all the other stuff we talked about earlier but yeah I'm excited I would really love to see this as a talk so yeah are you serious I'm happy <laughs> yes yes because like it's inspiring also because like like I'm yet to do a tidy Tuesday which is so horrible <laughs> and like even just being able to see someone do something it's like man I want to do that and like seeing someone okay I did it like they did it I can do it too and yeah because then we know this that your charts exist 
I'm assuming you have them on GitHub that mm -hmm. people can look at them like, okay, this is how she did that. What can I, what knowledge can I gain from what she did and then put my own twist on it so I can do it too. Because yeah. Okay. Could, do you think this challenge could be a bit too old for next year? Because this is for this year. And if it's like accepted next year, it would be a year old. I mean, it depends. I think perhaps you could even, like, if you're submitting the talk for next year, you could even kind of phrase it, like, put it as like, wait, is it is it going to be the same visualizations next year or are there going to be different ones? That uh, I'm planning to add more. Okay, but, okay. So, yeah, I mean, if in the end you like kind of take the skills you already learned from this year and then are able to add skills like yeah I still have to kind of think about it but yeah it's kind of yeah. always like this idea of like your you did your first one here's what you learned mm -hmm. from your first one and then here's your second one but I think when are the when are the submissions for talks I don't recall when you have Usually to submit like talks June-ish like May, June. Oh, but talks, okay. are, you, are they not earlier? Like in, are they, aren't month? they much earlier? Yeah, aren't they in February, March? Are they? Yeah, they might be. They're a lot earlier. So I think the they, oh, they open early, but they also are open for a very long time. Yeah. Usually. Okay. Yeah. So it'll also, depending on when the call for presentations is, because if the call for presentations is happening while, like, is happening and you're still doing the 2025 that will also it'll also depend on that mm -hmm. okay yeah. all right okay. gus yeah i'm oh, okay let's see i found last year's blog post oh wow okay call for talks i was way off Call for talks went up in mid January. What January? Not for yeah, problems. and then just... it said submission closes in February. Mm -hmm. It was way. Wow. Yeah, but I knew it was pretty crazy because conf is in August or was in August this year, so that's like six months away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Happy but. Yeah. Oh, then they extended. Oh, yeah, they just extended it to mid February. So, yeah, having helped organize like Cascadia are they're early. The call for talks are early because there's a lot that's behind the scenes. Them having to figure out like posit comps, they have a lot of talks, and then figuring out their schedule, what like what talks go together and all that. I can imagine it takes a really long time. So. Yeah, the earlier they put that out, the better, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I don't, okay. yeah, so I think talking about the 2024 is good. Yeah. All also, right. the, the original charts are all at least, like, 60-something, <laughs> 70 years old. Yeah. So, you, you get a little <laughs> bit more of a pass on that one, too, oh, because yeah. they're historical. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make the changes. And I don't know if, can can I present the same talk again later in the year? Oh, but yeah. then they want to be like, there are three more slots, isn't it? I, no, well, not I, there's one, one slot every month, I mean. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think if no one else is scheduled, yeah. Yeah, I've I've presented several times. So, as long have as you presented the same talk, or was it different? Different, but I think I've also presented like three or four times, which I think is probably tied with John for like most single person presentations. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and make the changes, and I'll maybe present it again soon. <laughs> And yeah, I can probably submit this as a talk. Yeah, and we can also 
ask John to add more rows to the spreadsheet. Yeah. Now, why can't it be twice a month? So this uh, project club originally started the same time that the book club DevOps for Data Science started. Mm -hmm. And pretty much everyone who did DevOps for Data Science was also doing project club at the time. And it just so worked out that the best times for both clubs were the same time. And so DevOps for Data Science would meet three times a month, and then Project Club would meet just once. Okay. So there's there's not really any reason, and tradition is no reason to only do once a month, but that's that's why. Okay. All right. Okay, no problem. If there's a space, I'll talk I'll give um uh... I'll uh, give the talk again. Yeah. I, with, the new, with the corrections. <laughs> and again, you could probably ask John and be like, hey, I really want to like try and hash this out one more time before yeah. on submissions close. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's another club that uses this same time slot on any other week. So it should be fine. But it, it's ultimately up to him, I guess, and Lydia and Tan. To hash that out. So, would you want to? Do you want to just sign up for December now, or do you want to do next month? I think someone has signed up for next month. Someone's right. in there's for November. Some for November, yeah. There's no one next oh. month or December. I think I'll do December. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll just copy and paste your information and put it in there. Yeah, I think that's okay. fine. Okay. Thanks, Lydia. No worries. Okay. But yeah, I think I'm done with... yeah, yeah, I'm excited. I think I'm done with the talk. Thank you so much, Lydia and Gus, for, for coming. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, thank you. Are you two going to give a talk in for PuzzleConf, or are you going to submit something? We'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have anything right now. Like, I have an idea of if I actually do Tidy Tuesday. Like, I gave myself a goal of doing 12 Tidy Tuesdays. This year, I have not done one yet. Oh, but... oh no. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but, yeah, if I do actually do any of them, and, like, I have an idea of how I could make it a top. Um, but, yeah, well, it'll depend on if I do any. <laughs> um but yeah there's a lot of, to talk about there um because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm learning more about the behind the scenes of tidy tuesday like mm -hmm. i hadn't realized john and tracy had been like they'd been the ones like curating the, the data sets like every week so now we're mm -hmm. trying to get more community community submissions like hey if you have a data set and you want to curate it like submit it and like we'll give people a shout out like hey so and so curated the data set they, or they found the data set for us and mm -hmm. yeah so I'm learning a bit more about the behind the scenes of Tidy Tuesday also I just learned there's a group that meets like they're affiliated with the Notre Dame data science um, department but they meet every Tuesday and they discuss like the previous week's Tidy Tuesday and like people um, people will show their visualizations that they made and then they'll look at the ones that are on um social media and then briefly look at like the data set for the following or for that week so yeah there's there's a lot to talk about with regard to tidy tuesday i just hope i actually have some of my own <laughs> submissions to talk about now that i have you two on the call i was wondering if any of you would like to give a talk for our ladies Khaboroni, like in november beginning of november end of november uh if I had hour anything to talk about, mm -hmm. but I do not. Is it like oh, you can talk about some? Of, how long is the talk? Like an hour, forty-five minutes. November. Mm. November. I'll see if I can think of something. We'll see. Oh, you okay. could you could talk about any work that you did this year or last year, Gus? You say you were in. You're part of DevOps. Yeah, I was doing DevOps for data science. Mm -hmm. Um, I did the book club. I have a special shout out in Alex Gold's book. But oh yeah, uh, I saw it's like you, John, and Tanache, right? Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> um, but you yeah, know, I yeah, it's it was cool. It was fun. Um, I think people have been trying to get a second round going, or at least there's been like murmurings of the occasional person going, hey, is this book club still going? But um, I think the next big one for me is Rust. That one's getting a lot of traction. Okay. So you're saying you don't have anything to talk about or not, any not at the moment. Work? And I've got a a busy life coming up over the <laughs> next few weeks. <laughs> All so right. I'm I totally totally sure, get like, it. Through the end of October, I'm not really sure what my life is gonna be like. Yeah. Okay. I will reach out to you if I can think something up like I'll reach out to you by like mid October. Mid oh, that's fine. If it needs to be a different month, but yeah, I'm down to do a talk. I just might not be ready for the moment, but I'll try. Yeah. That's fine. Totally fine. Yeah. But thanks, you guys. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes. All right.